Back to school savings are officially in session at Tanger Outlets. Shop the latest school styles with an extra 25% off during Tanger Style, our biggest sale of the season, now through August 25th. Plan your trip at tanger.com. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. This is the CRM Archaeology Podcast. It's the show where we pull back the veil of cultural resources management archaeology and discuss the issues that everyone is concerned about. Welcome to the podcast. Hello and welcome to the CRM Archaeology Podcast, episode 294 for August 7th, 2024. I'm your host, Chris Webster. On today's show, we say goodbye to our friend Richie Cruz and talk about how CRM companies should do better to allow techs time to take care of themselves. The CRM Archaeology Podcast starts right now. Welcome to the show, everyone. Joining me today is Heather in Southern California. Hi, everyone. And Doug in Scotland. Everyone. All right, everybody. So a little bit of a sad episode today. Friend of the show and really the Archaeology Podcast Network. He's been there pretty much since the beginning. Been a friend of mine, but Richie Cruz. And uh, I mean, a lot of you listening to this either know him or or could have, you know, worked with him because there's a lot of people strangely on the West Coast that listen to this show. I'm assuming there's East Coasters as well. (laughs) But for some reason, it's a lot of West Coasters that listen to this show. And Richie was primarily a West Coast archaeologist, although he did work some in the in the Midwest occasionally. And he yeah, we've talked about it before. We mentioned it a couple of times. He had a GoFundMe campaign, but he came down with stage three colorectal cancer last August, I think, or September give or take and kind of looked like he was actually going to maybe pull through it after he got a little bad in the winter time, not pull through it. I mean, this doesn't have a very high survivability rate, this cancer, but he had an infection and they stopped treatments, but then his infection went away, which they didn't think was going to happen. So that was actually kind of a, a little bit of a bump. And, but then in the last couple of months, he just got worse. And then on Friday, he finally, finally succumbed to the cancer and at least his suffering is over now. I mean, the last few weeks he couldn't really eat or, or drink or do anything on his own. They were feeding him of course, but he couldn't really do it. The cancer was just, the tumor was too big. It was just taking over everything. So, but I just wanted to, you know, talk today about Richie and, you know, his contributions to the show, archeology, span just everything. And, and a little bit about healthcare in this field, you know, and, and taking care of yourself and, we're not, we're no different. We're, we're different than other jobs. Don't get me wrong. Um, and we'll get to this, but it's, it's, it is a little bit different for some people in this field and how that works. But anyway, just a little bit of background about Richie. I mean, I first met him again, it was at least 10, 12 years ago. It was around then uh, I was looking back through my pictures and things. There's not a lot of, I don't have a lot of pictures of Richie, which is really sad. Richie was a photographer. He always took pictures. In fact, when I first met him, he was, you know, you always have like a crew of three or four people. Somebody's like the Trimble person. Somebody is the fo- photo person. You know, this is, this is all back 10 years ago. Nowadays, we kind of have devices that'll do all that stuff. So that's changing a little bit, but you know, back then you had a photo person, you had a, you had a Trimble person, you had somebody who was really good at describing features, you know, and doing stuff like that. And you would just have your responsibilities. Well, Richie was always the photo guy, right? And he would go around and, and take the photos and, and then we'd go around and somebody else would, you know, do the mapping in and, and somebody else would do the descriptions. And then the crew chief was around, you know, doing the overall descriptions and things like that. And, and Richie was the photo guy. And uh, he always loved vintage, vintage camera gear. He had all these crazy old cameras and, he was described to me when I first met him by the other people that already knew him fairly well, that we called him like he was this mystical sort of thing. You know, he was probably in his, he was in his mid twenties at that time, probably out of field school just by a couple of years. And, but he already seemed like this, this old soul kind of person, right? I hate those sort of cliche phrases, but Richie truly was an old soul. And I was, uh, you know, he was like, how old are you, Richie? And he, everybody be like, oh, Richie's easily two, 3000 years old. Like he's been on this planet for, <laughs> for years, That's for awesome. millennia. I know. Right. <laughs> like, like nobody knew how old Richie was. Richie just, and he, Richie would just sit there smoking his cigars underneath his big hat and just like laughing it up, not saying a word. He just, he was really quiet. He would just sit there, you know, smoke kind of billowing out from under his hat. 
hat and just let it roll. <laughs> he was just he didn't know, no word whatsoever. In fact, I, I wrote a post on this on uh, the Archeo Field Text channel on Facebook and somebody commented or the man wrote their own post. I can't remember kind of attributing Richie. And one of the things they mentioned, he had this like it was this uh, it was this vest that he wore this like utility military yeah. style utility vest. Yeah, that had all these pockets and stuff. And one of them was this huge pocket in the front and it fit perfectly a can of Pringles. And Richie would just walk around doing survey with a can of Pringles. I mean, he was otherwise relatively healthy. Right. Like he jogged all the time. He biked all yeah. the time. You know, in his last few years, even before the cancer, he actually started cutting out things like Pringles. Pringles. I think he knew that, you know, he had to probably make some changes in his life eating Pringles the first 10 years of his career. But uh, <laughs> yeah, he would just walk around with like a can of Pringles. It's kind of what he was known for a little bit aside from um, aside from many other things. That's <laughs> great. It's pretty funny. Yeah. Oh man. Gotta have your vices, you know, to make life you really do. worth living. Yeah. yeah. I know. I know. You really do. He, he's been on this show before. Uh, he's, I know he's been, I, I don't know, even know what episodes we were almost at 300 episodes here, but I know he's been on this show. He's co-hosted the archeology span show with me before him and I did a show called you call this archeology. span That was his little brainchild. And it was mostly a video show that you can find that on the APN YouTube channel. You can find it on his, you call this archeology span channel. Uh, no happy archeology span fun time. Sorry. Is what his, his That's YouTube. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's what his YouTube channel is called. It's the one that with the little kid caricature a little bit yes of like caricature of him yep yeah that he created yeah. yeah but that was one of the cool things about him too was he was he was so passionate about archaeology i mean so passionate about archaeology he was one of the few people that would you know go home he would put on an old you know an old jazz recording on a, on an LP, you know, literally on a record or something like that from like 60 years ago that he found at a, you know, a thrift shop or something and read, you know, riches to rust or something, you know, about old mining equipment. And yeah. he would just sit there and just absorb this stuff. You know, he was constantly yeah. watching YouTube about other, you know, just not, and not for any reason to like increase his skill set. We always say that on this show, he just truly was passionate about it okay. and just wanted to yeah. learn. <laughs> yeah. 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 It was just, I mean, I'm sure we've all known at least somebody like that. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is sad to lose somebody like that in the field. So he seemed like, you know, I didn't know him personally. I have talked to him before, mm -hmm. but never had the pleasure of meeting him in person. But yeah. I'll say in the last few months, every time he's come up with mutual friends, nothing but amazing things about <laughs> him. Right. And yeah. And it wasn't in a somber note at all. Like we all, I mean, everyone had this idea. Yes, he was sick, but had this idea that he was going to make it. And, right. and, and then, and, and they're unsolicited, but everybody just, he seemed like he had such a positive attitude and he was such yeah. a pleasant person to be around. Everybody enjoyed being around him. And I think that's something that sometimes we can lose in the seriousness mm -hmm. of, of what we, you know, you know, the, the struggles of the business, yeah. losing that childlike love for the discipline and that, you know, zest for life and the positivity mm -hmm. because the negativity, you know, just, it just brings you down, right? And it defeats yeah. you. You allow it to defeat you. So anyway, I just, the, that's the one thing that really sticks in my mind. And I have been watching his journey is that his positivity. Yeah. It's a, a beautiful personality trait it is and it's glad i'm glad you said that because it makes me think back like i've worked on a lot of projects with richie he's yeah, i've probably employed him on my in my company more than anybody else besides rachel and you know so we, we've had him on a lot of projects he's I've, I've worked with him a lot when i first met him and like both the company that we both worked for and i don't think i've ever heard him raise his voice once. Mm -hmm. I don't know what a yelling Richie sounds like, right? <laughs> I don't know what an angry Richie sounds like. Like, no, I don't think anybody does, to be honest yeah. with you. Like, he just lets it roll right off of him. Yeah. Now, that that is a an excellent positive trait. It's It, it can be a... 
I don't want to say negative, but it can be a trait that holds you back sometimes because he was, he, he confided me in me a lot. And he was almost like a career field tech for a long time there and, and never understood why he couldn't be a crew chief when he was working for people that, that had more knowledge than him. And I always told him, I said, Richie, you got to stand up and say, I want to do this. Nobody's yes. just going to look at you and say, can you be the crew chief? You have to stand up and do this. Right. And eventually he did, right? Eventually he did when he was diagnosed, he was actually crew chiefing on, on a project in Nevada. So, you know, and he'd been working for them for, I think a while, actually, maybe a year or something like that. And before that, he was working down in California for another company and they were, they had him out mm -hmm. doing these like tree surveys and things like that, you know, by himself sometimes just because they could trust him to do this stuff by himself. And sometimes he was with somebody else and he was kind of leading the show, but he was getting more and more leadership responsibilities. But I told him, I was like, Richie, you've got to stand up and say, I want this. You've got to take it. Right. And like I said, eventually he did, which I'm glad he did because he definitely had the knowledge for it. Right. He just had to. Yeah just had to get the confidence to get into those positions. And then of course, once he did, of course, everybody knew he belonged there, right? He had the knowledge for it. Yeah. He had the ability for right. it. He just, he just needed to get there. So. I think it's, this is a really good thing to bring up. Yes. You have to stand up for yourself and it's not an aggressive way. Sometimes all you hmm. have to do is raise your hand. You know, yeah. people don't, you know, I've explained this to, to people, you know, starting off in the business it's, you know, if you don't raise your hand and let people know, some people will just assume that you're happy where you're at and they're right. not going to know, like they may be very willing to give you that opportunity and they don't, but they don't know you want it. And then the yeah. other thing that I think another lesson here is that the reason I actually got to speak to Richie, I think, I think I actually spoke to him once with the podcast that I hmm. did a special and, and where I, I joined one of the podcasts, but anyway, but I actually talked to him over the phone because I had heard, and this was before I knew he had cancer or anything. I didn't know yeah. that I had had so many, like people had said so many positive things about him. I thought, Hey, you know, and I didn't know he worked in California. So when I found out, I was like, I'm going to call him up and see if he wants to work <laughs> on a few projects that I'm managing. Right. And uh, he yeah. wasn't available during those times, but I, you know, that's another thing is that when you establish a relation, you know, you establish a, a reputation for yourself Sometimes people will seek you out where you're saying, oh, they're mm -hmm. not just going to give it to you. If you so it's, a, you know, it's it's both sides. Right. You have right. to raise your hand, but you also have to work on your brand, work on yeah. your personal brand of being good to work with, of being a hard worker, of having, you know, what it takes to be to be out there in these different roles. And that takes time. It's patience. Mm -hmm. But he had that. Yeah. Well, I think that's to close out this segment. I think that's why he, you know, eventually when he did stand up and say, I can do this, I want to do this, that it was like probably to the people who gave him that, that opportunity was probably like a, all right, finally, it's about time. Yeah. Let's do this. <laughs> you know, right. it's, Cause it's not like a question. It's like, okay, great. Yeah. You should be doing this. Let's, let's, let's put you in this spot. Right. And so I think that was a good, a good move for him. And it would have been, would have been fun to see, you know, where he goes in the future. I know just one last thing. There's so many things to say about Richie. When we were talking last summer, he was actually talking about getting, you know, because Rachel and I live in an RV and stuff like that. Richie's always been into camping and things. And he's, he always famously lived in a canvas teepee when we were on site. Only <laughs> Richie would live in a teepee. And, and this thing was amazing, but he, uh, he put this thing up and didn't care, you know, didn't care who said anything about it. It was just like, he had a canvas teepee. He had a, he even had a smaller teepee for his extra stuff, like his camp stove and things like that. And then he ended up outfitting his Toyota Tacoma and uh, so he could sleep in that in a, in a, in a pinch, but also had like, you know, other stuff in there. Yeah. I mean, he really did all this stuff up, but he talked about getting a small trailer, like a ruggedized trailer so he could bring it out onto work sites and, and do different things. I mean, he was just always thinking about how he could, you know, I guess be more, be more useful, be more productive yeah. and, and get out there and be more helpful. And, you know, he's talking about buying a house in Reno um, cause he was renting for, uh, he rented this one apartment for like a decade almost. I mean, it was a long time. He was in this one spot. But he's talking about buying a house and it's just, I don't know. It's sad that none of that's going to happen now, yeah. but you know, well, let's take a break. And on the other side, I want to talk a little bit about healthcare and taking care of yourself as field techs back in a minute. Chicken tacos should only be trusted to chicken professionals. That's where we come in. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One comes with pico de gallo and creamy chipotle ranch. 
and the other comes with bacon, lettuce, tomato, and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Chicken taco experts since now. Order yours today in the Zach's Rewards app. Woo, saucy! Zaxby's. Shop Plato's Closet tax-free August 2nd through 4th for back-to-school styles. We sell the trendy, gently-used styles you need to make a difference in the world and in your wallet for back-to-school shopping. Save up to 70% off regular retail prices by choosing recycled styles. Save even more when you shop tax-free this weekend. Make a change that others can respect and repeat. Shop Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley this year for your back-to-school looks. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Chicken tacos should only be trusted to chicken professionals. That's where we come in. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One comes with pico de gallo and creamy chipotle ranch. And the other comes with bacon, lettuce, tomato, and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Chicken taco experts since now. Order yours today in the Zaxx Rewards app. Woo saucy! Zaxby's. Welcome back to the Sierra Mark KLG podcast, episode 294. We're talking about our friend, my friend, friend of the show, Richie Cruz. And, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about today, and I'm really interested in your perspective on this, Heather, as well, is, you know, just taking care of yourself as a field tech, because the perception is, well, let me, let me step back real quick, because again, Richie and I used to talk I mean, fairly often, even with us not really living in Reno anymore, uh, he, we would text back and forth quite quite frequently. Slack, you know, call on the phone. I mean, almost all the time. I mean, it was it was quite a bit. And he first told me before his diagnosis that he was having like really bad stomach pains in the field and was having a hard time eating and like keeping food down and stuff like that. And he just thought he just thought he was going through something and just had like a really bad stomach ache, you know, and you talk to somebody else like that. Like when we go back to Charlotte and, you know, we go to my, like my wife's family's houses, you know, these guys have regular nine to five style jobs for the most part. And they have regular doctors like, like a lot of people in the world do. And they have an ailment or they have something and they just like, you know, you just like immediately go to the doctor. Right. And you're just like, Oh, let me just get this checked out real quick. But as field techs, you just, you don't have that luxury because you may or may not have health insurance first off, right? You probably don't unless you're under the, the mandate and you've bought your own health insurance, which a lot of people are just, I don't know what they're doing. Um, if they haven't bought their own health insurance, probably just making the penalty payments or something like that. But either way, even if you do have health insurance, even if you do have a company that is providing that, and Richie did, Richie was working, I, I put this in Marquia Field Tech, Richie was working for ASM. And I, again, I applauded ASM for yeah. continuing to employ him for as long as they possibly could, giving him remote work. Like they were having him work on site records and stuff like that, stuff that Richie could do just to mm -hmm. maintain some kind of employment, keep him busy, you know, keep him keep his mind active and, and, and keep some money coming in the door. Right. Because it's, it's yeah. tough when you don't, when you, when you, you just are bedridden basically, but he could still operate a computer or his iPad or something like that. So there was that. And again, I also don't begrudge really ASM or, or any company really, cause I'm not really sure if anybody's at fault here. It's just the industry as a whole that I'm talking about. And this, this idea that, I mean, I'm going to say we, even though I haven't been a field tech in a really long time, I remember this feeling of thinking, well, if something's wrong with me and I'm out on a 10 day in some remote location, like if I have some sort of medical issue, I better just, I better just work through it because either A, I'm going to lose my job because I'm temporary and they could replace me at any time or B, if I leave, I leave, I lose two, three days of pay because I've got to drive all the way back to wherever the city is, find some kind of a doctor that's going to cost me who knows how much money. And then, and then drive all the way back out, assuming I can still keep working and I'm not on some kind of a, you know, some kind of a restriction. Right. And again, it's not really anything about the company. I'm sure if you told a company legally, I mean, some companies out there might be dicks about it. Don't get me wrong. But if you told somebody at a company, I have a medical issue, I need to go to the hospital. I, I, be hard pressed to find a lot of people that'll say, no, you're not going to the hospital. <laughs> you're not going to get this checked out. But people fear saying that because of the overall fear of retribution, right? And the retribution yeah. is this inherent, I'm going to lose my job or I can't afford this, whether it's lost time or just the medical bills alone. And that is just, 
that is just ridiculous. And Richie was kind of in that situation only because, you know, he took like a month of feeling that way before he finally went to the doctor. And I don't think he, I don't think ASM would have ever said, well, you know, you can't go to the doctor. He just felt this overwhelming air of responsibility towards the crew. He was running the crews out there. And it's like, if I don't do this, who's going to, right? And nobody told him that. Nobody gave him that. He felt that, right? And the fact that we don't make people feel like they can say, no, you know what? You come first. Your health comes first. We'll figure this out. Don't worry about that. We just, we send people out there to do these jobs and we don't make a focus on that sort of attitude. It's, it's get the miles in, get the acres in, get the sites recorded. That's what's always said as like these pep talks from field directors and PIs and nothing is ever said about your health is super important. You know, I mean, sure. They said they're like, they, they tow the party line and say, drink water mm-hmm. on sunscreen. But I almost never hear anyone say, in my experience, personally, you know, concentrate on yourself. If something's wrong, we need to fix you because basically you're our bread and butter. No, you know, right. <laughs> they don't say that. Mm-hmm. Now, what? And, and I know your take on this, Heather, is probably wildly different having been in that position, right? Yeah. So, I mean, well, what are your thoughts on that? I'm not a good person to talk to about this. <laughs> Because I have all those things that you're saying, like, you know, I have a full-time salaried position. Mm -hmm. I could go and, you know, I could go and work. I I, I could call in and and be sick and and I would still get paid, right? I still have that regular pay coming in. Now, if if you have to go and leave, then that's different, right? It's a, that's very different. But, and I think it is a combination. I do think that there is definitely a apprehension because people are are afraid even if the company was off you know just did everything right and like you said i really do think a majority of people majority of companies whether it's whether it's because they just want to cover their behind and and not Mm -hmm. get sued or they really do want to do the right thing or it, it really does come back down to the managers too and their attitude out in the field or or the ones that are con you know basically you know, leading these efforts. Right. So I'm just going to be honest with you. I have had, you know, spots on my face that I have not dealt with that I've been told, you know, could be an issue. Mm. And I, and my family are like, you have to go to the doctor, I have to go to the doctor. And I'm just like, I I have a feeling, you know, Richie was similar and I'm sure he had these other feelings, but, and it's, I think it's not as cut and dry as, somebody being afraid that they're going to lose money. I think it's also this, I don't know, machismo and I'm a woman, but it's that too, where, you know, or sometimes, you know, my mom, my mom was the same way. She didn't go to the doctor for a long time. She didn't like to go into doctors. She didn't feel like she could, she didn't trust them in some ways. And she had some reasons why. And also she didn't want to know the truth. And there were so many (laughs) different things. And I think that the conversation needs to be a little bit more like, you know, I told you off the podcast that I had my husband and I had a year, a couple of years ago, it was rough. We mm-hmm. lost three very good friends and every one of them had brain cancer. They were, they were gone within a year and they had, huh. they didn't know what the symptoms were. Like they had these weird feelings. They had back issues. Every one of them had back issues and it wasn't, they discounted it as not an issue. And So I think it's a combination of, yes, this not feeling secure as a field tech because you don't have that regular income coming in. There's not Mm -hmm. another option sometimes where you're either field tech or you're not. You didn't have the option like Richie did to go and do not everyone. Like if somebody were to come to me and told me I'm feeling tech. In fact, I've had this happen with multiple staff members. I find another role for them. And, and, and I'll find other work for them like ASM did. Not everybody feels that that's something that is an option for them. And sometimes some companies won't do that. They're just, let's next, you know, go on to the next. But I think it's that plus a personality issue. And also this, you know, concept that, you know, fear the unknown. And sometimes I just rather not know, (laughs) you know, I think it's more complex and, so what can we do about it, though? I mean, like we could say all this. It's more complex. What do we do about it? I think one thing mm-hmm. is as managers, we have to have it can't just be this rote. 
oh, we care about your well-being. We want you to feel well. We want you to be happy. But then you don't really feel that, (laughs) you know, you have to be. and, And sometimes that takes consistent attitudes out in the field. If and where you are, where you have an opportunity as a manager, whether it's a manager, project manager or field crew, where you have an opportunity in that moment to recognize that somebody is not doing well and to handle it properly, that says a million times more than, you know, HR saying that we care about your health. Yeah. You can have that at you can say that the company cares about it. It can all be wiped away with one incident where you don't react correctly. And then not only does that person who's not being treated correctly and it's not being reacted to correctly, but everyone else on the crew <laughs> feels that too. Yeah. And then that makes everybody kind of go into their shell and, and then unfortunately not taking care of themselves when they should. Mm-hmm. And you know what? Some people are going to abuse this. Right. So yes. if you have had this like open, po- open policy of, hey, anybody that needs to go, you know, take care of themselves and have time off, blah, 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 you know, do this. And some people are going to abuse it. And I think that's one of the reasons yeah. why, you know, you get crew chiefs, field directors, PIs, everybody up the chain that is just like don't want to handle it because they're like, oh, that one person is just going to be a jerk and, you know, take time off and and not do anything or or be a hypochondriac or maybe they really are a hypochondriac. I don't know, but they're going to go away for every little thing and it's going to cost us a ton of money. But, you know, OK, so what? You know, that that one person. Yeah, that one person is going to ruin it for 10 other people. <laughs> you, know? yeah, you have to have a but as a manager, you have to look at and say you, you can't be making a mistake to avoid a mistake. That's stupid, Mm -hmm. right? So, and doing something wrong to avoid somebody else doing something wrong, right? Or taking advantage, like you said. So it's patience. It takes some time. You have to get to know your crew. You also can't just be shuffling through crew where you're not being loyal to people. Like if Mm -hmm. you have a a loyal crew or, or a crew that you are loyal to and that you hire the same people and some people will say, well, wait a minute, how about giving other people a chance? No, you can. As your as your projects grow, then you hire more people as they're available. Yeah. But you have you can't just be just next, go through the next person, next person. You don't get an opportunity to get to know these people, right? right. You don't get an opportunity to work with them and see what their style is out in, in the field and to really understand them as professionals, as people. So you don't, you can't start using them in different ways and you don't get to know them personally. So you understand so that you can trust them. Trust comes with experience and you have to give people the benefit of the doubt because that's the right thing to do. And then, you know, and as a, as a technician or as part of the crew, just act in an honest way. And yeah. if you are sick, I mean, you know, I actually had one of one of the best jobs I had, and I was working for this company for five and a half years, five years. My first day, I had a flat tire. <laughs> oh, and geez. I was horrified. <laughs> I had a flat tire on the yeah. way. I was leaving. I was on time. Everything. I had a flat tire. I had to call them and tell them. I, I'm like, they're going to think I com- I'm a complete flake, you know? Oh, yeah. and, or like you're making it up. It's like the cliche excuse. Yeah. <laughs> like, I know. I flat tire. Like, of all things. <laughs> right. And the guy, the guy I'm sure was going, what the heck? You know, because now I'm creating issues for him. Right. But he took yeah. a breath and he's like, okay, all right. Okay. She has a flat tire. So she really maybe has a flat tire. And then you go on, she comes into work and you work and you continue to work with her. Now, if the next week it's something else, Right. And the week after that, it's something else. Well, then that's different. But you have to give people a benefit of the doubt to start off with. And this is, you know, I used to schedule referees for hockey um, from lots of different rinks. And there's a lot of people calling out last minute. In fact, I still do it for one rink, but I used to do it for a lot of different rinks. And the one thing, as frustrating as it was when somebody would call in or maybe not even show up, but they would call in, I have an injury, I've got this is pulled, that is pulled. And it's just like, and you may in your head think, Okay, this, okay, come on again, but you have to give them benefit of doubt or somebody doesn't show up. And the one thing that I had in my head all the time is when I would call and leave a voicemail and say, hey, so-and-so, 
you know, I have you at the rink today. Your partner's alone, da, da, da. Just want to make sure you're okay. The last yeah. thing I wanted to do is leave a nasty message. And let's say they got in a car accident, they passed away and their family's listening to that message, right? So you always right. have to give people the benefit of the doubt, right? And then if you find out something different, then you deal with that, but don't assume it. Yeah. 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 That's a good point. All right, let's take one last break and then we'll wrap this up on the other side back in a minute. Is your vehicle stopping like it should? Does it squeal or grind when you brake? Don't miss out on summer brake deals at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. Chicken tacos should only be trusted to chicken professionals. That's where we come in. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One comes with pico de gallo and creamy chipotle ranch. And the other comes with bacon, lettuce, tomato, and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Chicken taco experts since now. Order yours today in the Zax Rewards app. Woo saucy! Zaxby's. Welcome back to the Sierra Mark podcast, episode 294. And we're talking... Healthcare and other things in CRM. Doug, what are your thoughts on all of this? Man, you guys are describing America. Like, <laughs> right? I, I, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm, a, I'm playing in the back of my head like Childish Gambino's song, like, this is America. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, yeah, you know, a lot of this is systematic. And it's not just like archaeology, you know. you, you, you Sometimes we look at archaeology as, as a, a problems in archaeology is a pro, an archaeology problem. And really what you're describing is an American problem. Like, you know, America is, is the only rich country that doesn't have a nationalized healthcare system mm -hmm. or a, a mixed economy uh, healthcare system, as it were. And, you know, that's like your description of like, oh, you know, then you have to take off work and you have to go go back to your, your base city and then try to find a doctor and make sure they match yeah. with your insurance and you don't know what the costs are going to be. And there's copay and like it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Like what you're describing is is a shit country. Um, that like yeah, like if if you so in other countries, it wouldn't matter what doctor you'd have to go to. You know, other countries will have mixed healthcare, so there could be private ones, which may if you're doing private insurance, that may change some stuff. But usually, like general stuff's going to be handled by your general practitioner. You know, in America, you call it your family doctor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just a lot simpler, a lot less cruel, a lot less expensive. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And it just it works a lot better. There'd be proper <laughs> labor laws where that, like, if you did, like, yeah. So some of the things you guys are talking about is because, like, employers have so much leeway, I guess you could call it. Like, there's not a lot of legal protection for workers in the state. So, like, if you're in a different country, if you needed to take off, if you're not feeling well, you get a certain amount of sick days or sick pay. Some of it will be at full pay. Some of it, you know, it depends on the country. Some will be at, like, you know, partial pay or something like that. And then there'll, there'll be a limit. So, like, your discussion about, like, oh, if someone's going to abuse that, usually those limits are quite low. Like, your, your sick days that you can take full pay are, like, five days a year or something like that. It's not, it's yeah. not a great amount. And, you know, so the, the, there's always safeguards in place, but yeah, mm -hmm. uh, man, it, it, it <laughs> sort of goes back to like how we were talking about like unions a couple of well, months ago. And it's like, you know, the laws are so stacked against unions, but like the laws in America are so stacked against like humans, <laughs> like existing that I'm sorry guys, but like, yeah, a lot of these things, I don't know, man, like, uh, I don't know what to say other than like, you're looking at systematic change that needs to happen yeah. to affect it. And again, this is not just archaeology, like temp temp workers. I mean, you, you have so many stories about basically, uh, I mean, God, uh, the punitive punishment of like the American justice system. And basically, you know, if you, if you get enough tickets, you lose your car and then you lose your job because there's there's just no there's no backup there's no protection there's nothing there and that's yeah. basically what you've described is you know and it's not just archaeologists it's basically everywhere you know you, you could be a construction worker and you have the same thing happen most of those most construction workers are on you know sort of a self-employed or contract work as well just like archaeologists and obviously there's you know 
I don't know, was it 10 million, 20 million? I mean, there's so many millions of, of construction workers, same, same mm-hmm. thing, same conditions as archaeologists, same problems. And like, again, you get sick, you lose your job, and then you probably lose your insurance if you had any. You go into medical debt. If you survive it, you have basically wiped out all of your savings and all, all, all of your children's savings and all your grandchildren's savings as well. I don't know how many, was it a trillion, couple trillion in medical debt in the U.S.? It's, it's pretty insane. I'll, I'll stop wow. there with the depression. But I would just say, like, <laughs> you're, you're really describing like a systematic problem that, so the word choice here is not going to be poor, but it's like self-inflicted or not necessarily self-inflicted, but inflicted by a part of the country on the rest of the country. And yeah, some of these problems could easily be solved and are easily solved in other countries. And then that's not to say, you know, cancer can be exponential growth. So like, even if uh, Richie had, you know, gone a week or two earlier, you might still have been in the same position. Um, It's hard to say, Mm -hmm. but you know, it really is. It would have been a lot less cruel to him. And if I remember correctly, Mm -hmm. was he not doing like a, a GoFundMe page as well to help with his? Yeah. Yeah. Like, but he wouldn't, his last year, it was a year, right? Roughly? Yeah, or, uh, know, almost yeah. a year. His last year probably would have been a lot less stressful on like not having to run a, a GoFundMe pra- page, not having to worry about yeah. work, not having to worry about medical bills, or you know, passing on massive amounts of debt to whatever family member right. gets unfortunate enough stuck with it and stuff like that. So, you know, I'm not saying it would have saved his life, but it probably would have made that last year a lot less stressful for him. Yeah, indeed. I agree. So, yeah, I know we only have a certain amount of time, but I do I do want to so I don't think it's easily solved and I know this isn't just about medical here, but you know, there are, I I have friends around the world that do have socialized medicine, they're in a socialized medicine situation and they wait I mean, over a year. They wait months and months to even see a doctor. And they may mm-hmm. sometimes for treatment, it takes them a long time to get that in in Canada. For, I have many friends in Canada and that is the situation. So I don't think that there's an answer, but I also want to make sure that people understand because I think a lot of times, especially people that are young, that are young and they don't know. I mean, I know when I was in my 20s, I didn't know all about this stuff. Right. So I want to make sure that there's not a, a misunderstanding here with what your rights are. And again, please, it is the res- your responsibility to know what your rights are. So yeah. there are more sick days. Like I'll say the company I work for and the company I used to work for, there was many sick days that you would get for a year, even if you're not salaried, that people would, for the as needed, they would accrue sick days. So, and if you really are, if you're sick and you need, like you have cancer or something that's really, you know, a very serious illness, there's nothing, you might as well ask what you can do. Sometimes companies will allow you to bank the sick days, right? Or, mm-hmm. you know, there's there's different strategies. The other thing is, is that, you know, I've had this, I, and this firsthand, I've had people on my staff, one, she wasn't sick, but her husband was sick. And there were some, you know, some things that HR didn't want to do. And as a manager, I went in and I, I advocated for her and made sure that she was covered and she was able to leave and take care of her husband. And she was gone for a few months. And she did get disability and like she got, it was like 80% of her pay that she got, whatever it is in the state, right? And so there are things, don't think that like if you're sick and that's it. I mean, there are, you do have rights. There are different strategies that you can take to make sure that you're protected. And I know that when you're sick, it's overwhelming. And I remember going through it with this team member who it was frustrating. She had to go through all this paperwork and making sure that people were doing their job correctly at the hospital, that they were filling out the forms correctly. It's a pain in the neck, but yeah, you, you know, it is a pain in the neck. There's, you're going to get this across, across the world. It is that way. And is it right? Okay. It isn't, but there's, there are forms that have to be followed in order to make sure that your rights, that you have the rights that you, that you have and that you're able to communicate that in a way that, 
you know, allows you to take advantage of these different programs. And so know what your rights are and know what your rights are now rather than when you're sick, right? And then having a support network. Don't be afraid to ask for help. I mean, people want to help others. That Most people in this world are loving, compassionate people. And you can see that just from the GoFundMe page. And there's a, you know, GoFundMe page that was in my understanding was to support his family because he was, you know, they had a wonderful family unit and they all counted on each other. And I think they counted on him financially too. And so, you know, the GoFundMe was wonderful. If you look at people that didn't even know him that were donating to his page, I mean, people, it's allow others to help you people that you're actually, you're actually giving them a blessing to allow yeah. people to help you. Like you have, you can't just fall back. I see that a lot now because we have so much negativity in the world now, so much that people are exploiting to try to get their way in one way or another. And I, I hear so much negativity, especially from the younger group. And I want to encourage you that that negativity will take hold in your heart and your mind. If you don't know what your rights are, go out and, find out what your rights are, you actually will find that you'll be a lot more lighthearted if you know what to do in that situation. So I think Mm -hmm. Richie was doing that. So this isn't about Richie. I'm just saying in general, don't just lay down and say this whole country sucks or this world sucks or go and take care of yourself across the board, you know? Yeah. Well, I totally agree. Doug, final thoughts? Yeah, that's, I'd like to sort of echo Heather's comment and also just to sort of point out that likely, especially in archaeology, your managers will not know your rights. Yes. So it's actually incredibly important because, yeah, I mean, think about it. Most, if you're going through archaeology training, you rarely actually get trained to be, we've talked about this before on the podcast, mm-hmm. you rarely get trained how to be a leader. You rarely get trained to be a, be a manager. You rarely get, you know, sat down with like, they're not, companies don't spend like a couple of days of, you know, in-house training being like, yeah, this is all the HR stuff. Right. A few might do it if you're part of a bigger company. You might get like those little videos about like sexual harassment or something like that. But a lot <laughs> of the stuff is not going to be explained. Like you're, you're not going to be told about sick leave. You're not going to be told about disability. So you're not going to, even if you want to help at a managerial level, you probably aren't going to be equipped or trained or have the experience to actually do that. So it's important yeah. to, to know that, know your rights both from when you start, but also know your rights and know the system for when you become in charge as well. Because, you know, again, it'll differ and also differ between states. Mm-hmm. You know, different yes. states have different support, mm-hmm. all sorts of different systems. So, you know, you're, you're actually, there's not just one system in the United States. It's 50 systems, basically. Right. Well, yeah, well, probably more because also it depends, you know, are, are you a member of a tribe as well or a federally recognized group or, you know. So, I don't know, you, you probably might have like a couple hundred different systems to be realistic in the states. And so, you know, you need to know that information both for yourself, but also, you know, chances are you're going to need to, when you do that advocacy, you're also going to need to be able to present it as well to your boss because there's a good chance that they're just not going to know. You can be like, Mm -hmm. hey, I, you know, this is, this is the federal law where I I need time off and I, I, I'm going to be making up a number here. Well, I would say like nine out of 10 times, they're just going to be like, oh, really? Cool. Like never heard right. about this because they probably haven't. Uh, so yeah, it's super important. Heather's advice there on just mm-hmm. like know the laws, know your rights, know where you can get support. And that's that's across a whole range of stuff. Uh, we've talked about it in the past on on the podcast. Chris, I'm pretty sure it's in your book, but you know, it's, it's things like unemployed insurance and, you know, um, mm-hmm. taking unemployment and all those sort of things. But, you know, there's, If you're taking disability, that's actually possibly coming out of Social Security. Most people think of Social Security as retirement, but it actually covers a lot of people with disabilities as well. And you've paid into that. You, you, if you're doing a job, you're paying Social Security, so you're actually paying for your your disability, for lack of a better word, insurance. Yeah. Sorry, we we probably probably too much to cover in the last like two minutes of this segment. But just to say, 
yeah, you need to know it because a lot of people won't know it. And they, even if they want to be able to help you, they won't be able to because they just don't have that knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to say one, one more thing as from managers, people on the executive level, manager, people that are managing people, you have a response, a, a personal responsibility to, to advocate for those that are, that you manage, you have that responsibility. And, you know, there were with the one example that I was giving in a few others where even HR, they deal with so many different circumstances and they should be experts on it, but they're not. <laughs> and so right. as a manager, ask questions, advocate for your team members and make sure that they are getting the attention that they need and mm-hmm. and that they are getting the right answers. And even if that just means allowing the staff, you know, the your team member to kind of do their own due diligence, I am, in my case, I've done research just to make sure that they were getting the rights that they were supposed to have. But sometimes people, you know, the, even if it's just a matter of moral support that you're giving them and you're telling them you are, you're, you have their back, that makes a world of difference because when somebody's going through an illness and if they don't feel like they have people who are championing for them, that it just brings their attitude down and it, and it, it, it can lead to depression. And then on top of that, you have to have that the positive, the power of positivity is so important when it comes to healing. You just, you need to be there. Even if it's just moral support, you have a moral responsibility to do that. And, and then the last thing mm-hmm. I wanted to say is that I just want to give my sincere condolences to all of uh, Richie's family and friends. And I'm so sorry for your loss. And, yeah. and you know, he will not be forgotten. Indeed. Doug? Probably mine's not the best way to end this. I feel Heather's ending was pretty nice. I was just going to add the comment of, (laughs) yeah, just be careful of HR. HR is not there to protect you. It's to protect the company. So always, this goes back to the advice of know your rights is like, Mm -hmm. definitely, definitely do it. And don't, don't rely on HR. I've been in, I've been in conversations on the other side. Yes. I, I totally agree with Heather that you have a moral obligation to look after your staff. Not everyone is going to feel that same moral obligation. And, you know, a lot of what we've just sort of discussed is sort of one-off diseases. But if you have a dis- uh, disability, you yeah. are seeing these same effects quite often. And attitudes towards people with disabilities are not great. So, yeah, just to, to reiterate... Do your own, uh, well, maybe not your own research. There are lots of organizations out there and charities that provide advice. Unions, if you're looking at uh, yeah. you know, laws and employment and stuff like that, those are that's actually something in an area where unions can give advice and are really great at. You know, so there's there's a lot of other places where you can get expert advice. And I would just end with, yeah, please do that. And mm-hmm. I'm sorry, Heather said it so eloquently. I feel like if we just cut her last like 30 <laughs> seconds and then just shift it to the end right here, we could end on that, which yeah. is a really nice way to yeah. end it. Well, I did have one more thing to say as well. It's uh, I, I really am thinking back to the comment. Well, when I was talking about you know, the fear, right, that people have of just saying, hey, I've got an issue, I need to take care of myself. And if we could take away the fear, then that would be a, a giant step in the right direction, right? And you know, companies are the are one part of that. But if we could take, a, take away the fear in another way, I, I just keep thinking about, and I was looking up to, we belong to an RVing club. We belong to several of them because it gives us several advantages and, you know, discounts and things like that. But one of them is called Escapees, and they have this program called CARE. And it used to really refer to retired escapees, but now it it's more for full-time RVers. And if you have a health issue or something that would take you off the road, they say, instead of getting rid of your RV and buying a house again or doing something like that, you go to you can go to their facility. It's actually in Texas where their headquarters is. And you can stay there, right? And it, it, there is a cost to it, but it's heavily subsidized, right? By sponsors and things like that. And our membership fees that we pay as part of this club. But it's basically something that just gives you somewhat of a worry-free 
time to where you can deal with whatever illness or something that you're dealing with and you don't have to deal with it yourself, right? Your spouse or, or partner or whoever. If we had something similar, obviously not something like that, but something similar where, you know, a field tech could call up and say, you know, they're, they're, I mean, sure, there would have to be some kind of dues or heavily sponsored by companies and things like that. But, you know, they call up and say, hey, I got to take like three days off of work in the middle of a session and they're not going to give me per diem. And well, maybe they're going to give you pay, but they're not going to give per diem and you're relying on that and things like that. And it's like, great, you know, here's a check, you know, no, no, like, you know, we'll Venmo you this right now, you know, and you're a member, you get this right now. I mean, obviously there'd be limits and things like that, but we need something like that where people could, that, that can help take away that fear. I don't know. Just something I, would, I was thinking about. I would actually say but, this is a good area of where unions can work because you do pay dues. It can. And they do keep sort of right. pools of money for event, not just for like if you go on strike and need it, but for other activities like this. So sure, um, this, is, this is an area where actually unions have a little bit of influence and ability. And, and it's, it's that's a good place there as well. And if we can get seasonal field techs, actually a union that will accept seasonal field techs that have 18 different employers a year, then great, right? If we can do that right now, a lot of the unionization that's happening is at the is at the company level, so to speak, right? There, there, like people, like companies are unionizing, but we need to be able to. We need uh, companies aren't the problem. I mean, they are right. We have people that were full time at companies. They're in a little bit better situation, but it's the seasonal field techs that really need the help. And, you know, unions are probably they're going to probably be the last ones attend, you know, with union attention, to be honest with you, if it comes around ever. So anyway, that's a whole other discussion <laughs> that we could have on this podcast, which we probably have. In fact, I know we have. So but anyway something to think about and with that we will end with you know farewell to richie and you know again my condolences as well to everybody that knew him and you know anybody else who's going through this right now hopefully you're not alone and you're you know you've got some support feel free to write into the show you know not a whole lot we can do but feel free to write into the show tell your story if you want to and we can you know just see if we can we can get it out there maybe there can be some help so anyway with that thanks everybody and we'll see you in two weeks that's it for another episode of the crm archaeology podcast links to some of the items mentioned on the show are in the show notes for this podcast which can be found at www.arcpodnet.com slash crm podcast please comment and share anywhere you see the show if you'd like us to answer a question on a future episode email us use the contact form on the website or just email chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com Support the show and the network at arcpodnet.com slash members. Get some swag and extra content while you're there. Send us show suggestions and interview suggestions. We want this to be a resource for field technicians everywhere, and we want to know what you want to know about. Thanks, everyone, for joining me this week. Thanks also to the listeners for tuning in, and we'll see you in the field. Goodbye. 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 This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, DigTech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Rachel Roden. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.